I'm going to talk um, about for the trust. We've heard it mentioned a few different times. Um, for the basic talk, we're going to have. We're thankful to have um, a four people who have been on somebody's trials to hear their experience. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background. We we may if we have time, we may just kind of do it by kind of show of hands if you have questions specifically for uh, for the uh, patient panel folks. Um, Otherwise, if we're kind of running tight, we may just kind of go on to the next talk, and we'll try to do that all at the end. And it may be just from a time standpoint. I know it's going to be a long, long morning. So uh, we're also going to be available later if you have uh, specific questions about what you've seen today or um, in the future too. Okay. So again, I'm going to talk about clinical trials. Um, pretty, pretty basic stuff. What is a clinical trial? We're talking about the history. We describe uh, what it is to be what, what a trial is. You know, why do we do these in the first place? You know, how, how do we do them? And then who does them? Who does them? Who participates in them? And again, you'll hear from uh, some of the people and patients, what does it mean for them? And even options for other people as they consider these. So clinical trials are a part of research. And so you'll hear that word, and a lot of people don't really know what that means. And so it also has a lot of different words. because these experiments, trials, protocols, studies. What I try to do is just kind of give you a general flavor of research. And so when people say research, it could be a lot of things. One of them is this, what I dubbed as kind of test tubes, which is basic laboratory research kind of with Bunsen burners and beakers and all, trying to find different things. So there's new genes and targets, uh, even new drugs and developing drugs. As a general paradigm, we go into living creatures, be mice or guinea pigs, people often describe themselves as that, but really it's trying to understand it really in the biological context you know, testing some of these things um, in animals, if you will. Um, and then there's people. And there's a lot of research with people. Sometimes we just observe people over time, different exposures, but then there are clinical trials specifically. And try to make it as basic as possible, this is the study of people to determine if an intervention, like a medication, drug, surgery, uh, is better than another. Okay? So, you. I listed a few things here that you may have heard of, although probably have not inflicted many. And a lot of that is because of trials. So how do we improve upon this? We do these for research. So some of, again, it's in basic laboratory research. We understand how TB develops, um, polio and HIV. HIV, not that long ago, was a death sentence, and we, we hardly hear about that now. A tremendous amount of effort um, and work has been done in all of these different diseases, um, and we've been able to control that, um, some of them completely, even. Actually, even think polio, there's more polio for the vaccine than there is out in kind of the world, if you will. There's a whole other low paradigm, kind of the next frontier, these heart disease, Alzheimer's, and cancer. So with a focus on research and trials, we hope that also, um, particularly when what we're talking about here today, cancer will be something of the past. Okay, so again, basic framework of what we do in research is we ask a question. How do you develop melanoma? How do you treat melanoma? How do you get rid of melanoma, for example? And then we try to answer that. And the way we do that is we try to design an experiment. You know, one, one group of people get one thing, we get another, whether that be surgery, medication, or whatever, and we follow it over time based on a lot of little detail. And if we find out that one is better, so significant, and there's kind of details to that, um, then potentially we have a new treatment, and that moves forward. What can, the problem is if we don't do that in a rigorous way, there are a lot of claims about things that work. Um, we really don't have good data for that. And a lot of people, unfortunately, could get hurt. Um, so we're going to talk, kind of walk through a little bit of history here about trials in general. Um, and I'll touch on all of these uh, things up here in some context. So the first thing is, Dr. James Lynn, back in 1747, is really attributed as the first modern clinical trial. So he had noticed, he's a, a, a surgeon on the ship, sailors were getting scurvy. If you've ever heard of that? Um, so these kind of putrid gums, lethargy, people were pretty ill. So he looked at it as, you know, why are people getting this and what can we do about that? So he had this idea that two, two sailors each would get this potion made up by a doctor, if you will. Cider, vinegar, so two again each. Um, elixir vitriol, seawater, and then oranges and lemons. And he followed them over time. And they would all get the same thing. They were in the same place on the ship. They got the same food, kind of boiled biscuits and uh, sugar water, but then got this as an additional intervention. Anyone take a guess which one? 
born in the lake. So how do we know that? Well, in part, is because of Dr. Lin. I mean, he had postulated that this may be, there's something within these that people could do better. And it turns out, actually, in a very short period of time with this intervention, those sailors got better, and the description is that they started actually help others. And it took a number of years, though, why, it's unclear, why this actually, be, this became kind of a standard on ships. So again, you hardly hear about that now. But it turns out, so it's vitamin C deficiency, right? So again, looking, uh, some of this work, you know, we think of, let's learn about it in a lab, and then let's test it. But something like this is also important, that sometimes we'll just do something because we think it, be, we think it is correct. And then we go back and try to figure that out. So this is what we call translational research. Again, sometimes from the lab or we can bench to bedside and then bedside to bench. So you're understanding what happens with people and then go and try to figure it out in the lab. So this is all part of research. So the you know, human trials, uh, clinical trials have evolved. And there are a number of different factors that I'll try to illustrate for you. One of them is this idea of a placebo. Uh, we think of it as kind of a sugar pill, if you will. It was actually um, described for us really in 1863 for rheumatism, so it was a treatment for, you know, what we believe to say, well, what the, the doctor wrote this, Austin Flint, uh, was more to please than to benefit. So there is this concept of a placebo effect, whereas you, you believe you are getting something beneficial and you feel better and do better. This other concept um, of a double blind, this was kind of the first double blind trial. So blinding is basically, you don't know what you're getting. And when we double blind, it means the person, the physician or investigator, also doesn't know what you're getting. And we follow people time. There's a concept for that. This was also first described in Patulin for the common cold. And then in 1946, this idea of a randomized control trial. You've heard these words a little bit here. Um, again, we believe this to be kind of a reverse way. You're not picking and choosing what you're getting. It's randomly assigned, kind of a roll of the dice, flip, flip of a coin. And again, this is a streptomycin versus usual care. And it turns out that all of these things seem to appear to be beneficial. But this is the concept of the design. And this has also evolved a good bit. I mean, there's a, a tremendous amount of research just trying to figure out how to do these correctly. And this comes down to base, two basic concepts. Is how, do you, how do you design and do these to have a good quality result? And so you want to feel confident in the end that you have the right answer. And so this is where this idea of blinding, and, there's other factors, but blinding, placebos, and randomization come into play. But there's a huge other, other part of that, and that's safety. And we'll talk about this as well. So this is where, for people who've been on trials who've heard or thought about it, it's this idea of consent, meaning this is what we can do, this is what will happen, um, and you would want to be informed of that, and you say, okay, I'm interested in doing that. But that also includes monitoring, so monitoring by the people doing it, and then even externally, so an independent group that have some kind of oversight for that. So let's talk about all of those things. Let's first start with quality. Okay, so we're going to do an experiment here. Actually, a couple years ago, Dr. Say, when you were talking, had these little men running around. And that's the most common uh, response I got. Have those talks of, oh, I love Dr. Sable's old army men running around. So I decided I'm going to try, try my luck at, uh, at entertainment to, uh, to illustrate a point. So here's an experiment. We have two uh, racetracks and two mice. These would represent, actually, multiple mice that would run on that same track. So we say, what, what, what can we do to see if one intervention would um, make them go faster? So, for example, let's try food made at the University of Michigan. I'm going to feed half the mice food made at the University of Michigan, and then they're other <laughs> mice are going to get food uh, made at Michigan State. Some may, some may guess how this is going to turn out. But, <laughs> but you know, Michigan State is the best veterinary program. So, you never know. Okay, so half, half the mice get Michigan food, half the mice get Michigan State food, and let's run the race. It may be a surprise to some, but the mice fed food for Michigan won. But some might say, you know what? You know, you're picking and choosing. You know, are you going to give mice that look better or stronger? Are you going to give them the, the, the food for Michigan because you want them to win, right? So one of the concept is to randomize. So again, kind of flip a coin, um, randomly assign. There's different ways to do this, but basically you kind of, um, without looking, you're just kind of giving one after another uh, different food, okay? And so, again, these mice were randomly chosen to get either the food from Michigan State or from Michigan, and we run the race again. <laughs> oh, 
behold, it looks as if, despite the randomization, the people, the mice fed Michigan food is still won. Again, some might say, you know what? The mice that are getting Michigan food know that they're going to run faster, right? Or the patients, let's say, who are going to get something, just know that it's going to be better. Or the docs still say, hey, I'm going to pick and choose maybe in some way, or even in the end result. So they, let's say this race is a little bit closer. You know, you say, is one really better than another? So that concept we do um, to, to control for that is blinding. So again, there's biases involved with all of these things can minimize that. So same thing, we're randomizing, um, not picking, just picking out of a hat, and we're blind. So the mice don't know what they're getting. And the double blind concept, again, is like, I don't know, or the investigator won't know what they're giving. And then we run the face again. Anyone want to take a guess? Uh, this. So it looks like uh, the mice on top one again. Turns out oh. this mice fed University of Michigan. Okay, so this other concept is placebo. So this idea of placebo, and there's a lot of detail to this in particular trials, maybe unethical, but in certain situations it's certainly appropriate. So the idea of a placebo, again, we call it a sugar pill. So this is, you know, you say a placebo could be, why don't you just give people food from PetSmart or, you know, sugar, sugar food, if you will. And also, if you're comparing one treatment to another, yeah, it's better than that, but let's say, I mean, if Michigan food is better than Michigan State food, is Michigan State food still worthless, or is it maybe better than giving regular food? And so this idea of a placebo. So we potentially run this, uh, each individual treatment, against a placebo. So we randomly assign it, they're blinded to the treatment, and we're going to compare one to an intervention versus a placebo when we run the race again. So it looks as if the mice on top was again one, two, one blind, and we look to see what people got. The mice got. So, and then finally, <laughs> drum roll. So we're going <laughs> to, uh, again, randomly assigned, blinded, we're going to compare Michigan State food to placebo. And we're going to run the race again. <laughs> you pay attention. Oh. Who votes that the, the mice on the bottom one? How about the mice on top? Okay, the mice on top look like they won. Oh, that was a dramatic pause there. <laughs> oh yeah. So Michigan State won. Although you're right, it's pretty close. I gotta just throw them a little ball. Okay, so so we give them a little trophy because it was just there. So what did we learn? What did we learn from that? What did we learn? So here's as if based upon that controlled trial, and mice fed food from you them faster than placebo. And mice fed food from U of M faster than MSU. And mice fed food from MSU are more likely to be cat food. <laughs> and we feel confident that that is true because it was randomized, blinded, we're controlling for a lot of the biases that might be within that trial. So, any questions about that? Okay. So the other important piece of this is safety. So you want to know what you're doing. Um, it, we're not harming people. And so it's a long history of this as well. And so um, it's kind of the history of patient protection law. Um, there's two um, <coughs> main kind of um, events, if you will, that happened, and they're both during World War II. So the top one is this: uh, during World War II, the Nazis had experimented actually on patient or on people in concentration camps. Um, you know looking at different uh, exposures to chemicals, surgeries, burns, all kinds of things without their consent, obviously. And then in this uh, kind of infamous unit 371, or 731, with the Japanese and experiment in the same thing. A, bunch of, a number of different interventions, and so this is that kind of depicted there. Actually, it's up with hundreds of thousands of people were experimented on without their consent. And so, uh, obviously, these atrocities actually led to kind of the put to death of um, some around 20 physicians, and this happened in Nuremberg. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that came out of this Nuremberg Code, which is how do we run these trials um, appropriately and safely? And so, there's a number of different points. I'm just going to walk down real quick. So, this, these trials have to be voluntary, people have to be well informed. We want to aim for a positive result for society. These are based on some previous knowledge, and that's when the concept of whether it's in the lab, whether we know something, and we move that forward to the next step. It should avoid unnecessary suffering. 
It should not be we go in the risk of death or disability significance. The risk we want to be proportional to the potential benefit. There must be protection against these risks. The staff must be fully trained. The human subjects must be free to quit at any time. They must stop the experiment at any time if dangerous. Um, and so all of these things were kind of put into place and set, set a framework. And you might think, well, that doesn't happen in the United States. It's only happened in Nazi Germany and uh, World War II with, uh, in the Japanese in the South Pacific. Well, it turns out it's not true. And this is a kind of an infinite, in, infamous experiment as well. Um, and this is run by the U.S. government and the U.S. Public Health Service, if you've heard about this. So this is a, a trial really kind of following um, uh, 600 black men in rural Alabama with quote unquote bad blood, <coughs> syphilis as we know. We started in 1932. About 400 black men were known to have syphilis, and about 200 that they followed did not. So the concept was to follow people along and see what the long-term effects of were, were un, of untreated syphilis, and they followed them along. Um, and they were, you know, reported to have, hey, we, we get free care, you get free travel to kind of look and draw your blood and do other things. Um, but it turns out in 1947 that penicillin was found as a treatment for syphilis. But unfortunately, the men on this trial uh, were not told that. And they continued to follow, the so U.S. Public Health Service continued to follow those people uh, over an extended period of time. And it wasn't really until 1972 that it was, um, that it was uh, the whistle was blown on them. But this is you know, a little too late with multiple men had died from the complications of syphilis, multiple uh, wives had been, uh, women had been um, contracted syphilis as well as multiple uh, and children were actually born, infants were born with congenital syphilis, which is really a debilitating disease. So really, again, a number of things that have happened um, to kind of generate uh, control. And so 19, uh, uh, to oversight, one of those 1974 is the National Research Act, which is kind of the framework for um, the commission uh, for the protection of human subjects. Um, and the Belmont Report kind of outlines that and really kind of details, again, for the ethical um, treatment of people patients on these trials. And the bottom line is it really is a, as a general concept um, and tenets is a respect for persons, do no harm, and justice. And again, a lot, number of things have gone into this and a number of different modifications. But really this is why, for people who have ever contemplated being on a trial, why we talk about this. So the Institutional Review Boards, or IRB, if people have, looked, have, been, uh, just, have talked about trials, it's where you get these consent forms. And they can, they can be very, very long and complicated. Uh, but they're actually boards to see, you know, what simple language that everybody can understand. We talk about this over time, and basically patients will provide their consent, knowing what they're getting into as they get into the trial. So again, these, we believe we've been through a lot of different things, and we believe to have a fairly rigorous way of testing that, but there's still these ideas of, are we doing it correctly, and it, should this be kind of across the board of how we do it? One of the examples of, you know, should we reconsider how we do it, is this a trial actually in melanoma, if you've ever seen uh, or heard about this. So these are actually two cousins, um, both with a BRAF mutation. And again, you'll hear later, you heard a little bit about this, you may know. So BRAF mutation is in the melanoma, and it drives the growth of that cancer. We have a few different treatments that actually can control that growth um, by, by targeting that. So this actually uh, cousin was diagnosed first, and he actually has a BRAF mutation. He was on a trial of a new drug, the BRAF inhibitor versus chemotherapy. So they were randomly chosen. Half the people got uh, this new BRAF inhibitor, half the people got chemotherapy. This other cousin actually was diagnosed after him, was also in the same study with the BRAF mutation, and he was randomly given chemotherapy. And they followed his patients along. Turns out that the, the chemotherapy was not working, but in this trial, the way it was designed, is that you could not cross over. So if you got chemotherapy, there was no chance that you could actually cross over and get potentially an effective therapy. Although, again, at the time, we didn't know that. Um, and unfortunately, this is the first medication out. And so it's actually, across the country, really, you could not get that drug. So unfortunately, uh, this patient had died. And this, you know, everyone went to berserk, patients and community, as well as the um, scientific community, and say, look, we know from preliminary studies that these drugs are, are pretty effective. I mean, do we really need to do a trial like that to, uh, to determine if these are really beneficial or not? It wasn't like there's maybe a little bit of chance of a benefit, let's do these giant trials. This is a dramatic, dramatic response to these agents in very preliminary studies. So this is that we were actually approached to uh, participate in that and just 
I was uncomfortable with that, so actually we did not participate in that. But the reality is someone made a, cup, a tough call, and they said, we are not going to cross over. And in the end, I do believe that um, although people had died on the trial, more people were probably saved because what happened is they looked, they did the first look, and it was so dramatic that they stopped the study and actually was approved within three months, uh, which is pretty dramatic and um, really kind of record setting as far as how fast that could be approved. And it was out there on the market. But again, this idea that you know we're really doing it right and we need to kind of be blanketed the same for everybody. So in melanoma, we've talked about kind of dramatic change. And because we've done these more rigorous trials, um, you know, testing some of these new agents. We, and we've done these trials for a long time, and unfortunately melanoma and most of them didn't work. But it turns out recently, um, a lot of these therapies have appeared to be effective. And so based on the safety and efficacy in these individual studies, it was, uh, six new agents were approved by the US FDA in the last, four, in the last five years, last four years. And again, you may have heard of these, but ipilimumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab are all approved. Because it, it, those trials had shown people living longer. And now, just in a couple of days ago, the combination of these two together was approved. And also, again, these, these are immunotherapies. And these are these kind of quote unquote targeted genetic based therapies. So, all of these have individually shown benefit. And now, again, we, we expect another one to be approved maybe within the next couple of weeks. And again, in combinations as well. So, huge, huge shift. Um, actually, nationally, melanoma, the results in melanoma trials have really kind of led, um, led the results um, for, uh, in, onco in the oncology world. So really from very little to uh, pretty substantial. But of course, we still have a long, a long way to go. So this is an op-ed actually in the, um, in the New York Times, actually uh, written by a patient, actually, with Merkel cell carcinoma, with this idea that we need to do more trials. We need to do trials uh, to answer some of the unanswered questions to do trials potentially help the people who don't respond to some of these therapies and also rare situations. We've heard about mucosal melanoma, Merkel cell, ocular melanoma, melanoma the eye, all of these things that we need to do. Um, and this actually op-ed piece talks about some of why, why don't people participate. The statistic is about 3% of people uh, would participate, a cancer patient would participate in the United States. And if, I mean, if we don't have a solution or an answer, then why don't we, why don't we have more people participating in these trials? So, again, fortunate to have uh, four people here who have been through some of those trials um, to give their experience, tell their story, and talk about, um, we'll talk a little bit, uh, some detail about um, maybe what we talked about already uh, as far as the appropriateness of placebo or the randomly and how they felt about that. So, first person I'm going to introduce is Gail. I'm going to let her tell her story and maybe have the lights up for And Dr. Lau asked me to tell you, briefly tell you my story. So um, I am 67 years old, and I grew up in Canada. So our first speaker talked about intermittent sun exposure. Our summer is July and August, and that's it. It's freezing cold every other place. <laughs> so yes, I, I was, um, and I'd like to suggest that maybe another risk factor other than the five that he mentioned is adolescent ignorance. And, and so I was one of those typical kids that laid out in the sun with baby oil and iodine, I know. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm not surprised that this has happened. Um, I, I've had 11 other uh, removals that were all basal or squamous and um, very uh, non-malignant or n they, were, they were not pathological at all. So um, an annual physical in uh, February of 2014, and my primary care physician found something that she, she said, I don't like this. And it, it looked to me like an AK. Um, I am a nurse, so I sort of know a little bit about it, but not very much. And I happened to have a, an appointment with my dermatologist two weeks later. I faithfully at least went to a dermatologist once a year. And, uh, and I think I was smart enough not to use a tanning bed, thank God. Um, uh, and that the dermatologist removed it, the lesion. He didn't think it was anything either. He thought it was an AK too. And um, three days later, he had been desperately trying to get a hold of me, and my husband tracked me down at work, and and said, call him. And um, he said it's a melanoma and it's a millimeter thick, so you need to you need to come and see me right now. And um, actually, don't come and see me. I want you to go to the University of Michigan where he trained, actually. Now, I work for a very, very large healthcare system that's a competitor of the University of Michigan. 
Uh, so I had a couple of deep breaths there, and then I went and talked to all my nurse and physician colleagues. And the U of M program is a coordinated care program. It's interdisciplinary. They have all the people in the right place at the right time talking to each other. So I made the decision that that's where I wanted to go, and I came to see Dr. Sable. And, um, and he scheduled me for a seminal node biopsy after talking to me for a few minutes. And uh, 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 just a really positive thing is in that week between getting the diagnosis and seeing Dr. Sable, your, your emotional status is just a wreck. Um, so being a nurse, I went on to every website that I could possibly find, and the U of M website actually had more information for me that I understood, and it was clear about what could happen, what would happen, what this all is about, so on and so forth. So sentinel node biopsy, and then there's that horrible three or four days. Um, they they underpromise and overdeliver. They tell you it's going to be a week, <laughs> and then they call you in three days. And in this case, they called me in three days, and I missed the call. Um, so now I'm like hyper, super, and I called back, and it took a little bit of while, but um, uh, his PA called me back right away and said, "You have a positive sentinel node." And the very next thing she said is, "Don't worry, we cure this all the time." And I just, it was fabulous. I just took a deep breath and. I'm good. Um, we want to see you X, Y, Z. It was, it was about six or seven days, I think, later. And we're going to schedule you for the total excision. excision. Um, and um, in, the mean in, in between there, uh, my husband and I had scheduled the trip of our lifetime to Europe. And um, it, was, it, it was something that we had planned for years and years, and we'd saved, and, we're, and it was like maybe seven days away from between when I saw Dr. Sable and the sentinel node biopsy, and he said, go, absolutely go. Um, enjoy yourself, have a great time. If it's in the lymph nodes, it's in the lymph nodes, and two weeks is not gonna make any difference. So we did, and we had a wonderful time, awesome time. Um, came back, um, scheduled the, the, um, the full um, axillary. Um, my, my melanoma was on my shoulder, not a place that you look often kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we, we, I was looking all over my skin and so was the derm. Um, after the, um, the axillary excision, I had a little bit of trouble. Um, I ended up with a, a cellulitis around the drain area. Um, and I live about an hour and 15 minutes away from here. And again, the coordinated care that I experienced here was so positive. My husband and I drove all the way from there to the emergency room here so they could take care of me with that drain problem. Um, that's the only hiccup I had in my whole course of treatment because I couldn't wait to get that drain out. Man, oh man, that was going to be the best day of my life when that thing came out. Um, I, our our uh, coordinated care, again, um, Dr. Sable's staff knew that I was going to be looking at adjuvant therapy. And they made the appointment with Dr. Um, Lau, I think it was almost two months in advance because they're so busy. So as soon as I had the drain out, a week and a half later, I had my appointment with Dr. Lau. And we talked about the clinical trials or the options that were available to me. At the time, I didn't know what my um, gene state was, but we elected to have um, some of the tissue sent to California to see whether or not I was BRAF positive. And um, in the meantime, we were talking about what options I had. The, um, the, the one that was being considered was interferon, and unfortunately, I have a heart condition that, would, that precluded me from going on that therapy. So I, did, I had minimal options, but as my colleague here is gonna say, the clinical trial was nothing to lose here, because um, surveillance is really, really important, and my gosh, do they ever surveil you, wow inside and out really often. <laughs> so um, after the, the gene, uh, gene um, diagnosis came back positive for the BRAF, Dr. Lau and I and his team and Susan and Alisa at the time uh, picked, um, I, I can never remember the names, but it's the DRAB-FAB, I call it DRAB-FAB <laughs> combination. And um, I started on it in September of 2014. Um, the first six months that I was on the clinical trial, I was exhausted. I'm, I'm typically 
somebody who gets five to six, maybe seven hours of sleep, really rarely. I needed to sleep 12 hours. Um, I needed to sleep 12 hours. I had to call my husband a couple of times to come and drive me home from work because I knew I couldn't get in the car. Um, I had minimal fever, um, a minor rash. Um, the symptoms other than fatigue were nothing. I was doing really, really well. And this is an oral drug, by the way. So a couple of tablets in the morning, three at night, good to go. Um, finished my clinical trial um, just last month. And um, I'm just really excited about um, hopefully learning. Well, I don't want to learn whether I was on it or not because that would mean my disease came back. Um, but I just, I'm, I'll learn about the research. Thank you so much. Just maybe one question. So, so this trial was, is a randomized trial and it was blinded and there is a placebo in that. So half the people would get this combination, um, and half the people would get a placebo, but you didn't know what you got, and we didn't know what you were going to get. So maybe just maybe comment on that about what, what you were thinking, and I know you said there was nothing to lose, although I think uh, uh, Terry will tell us a little bit about maybe some of the other issues that might have happened with treatment, but what were your thoughts, actually, because you're making the decision to go into that? So um, very, very strong faith, um, and I, I prayed really hard and long about it, and. It, it was the right decision for me. And, but the question that everybody asks you is, do you think you're on the rug? Do you think you're on the rug? And, and of course, we always ask each other. Well, I just need to know, my, the very scientific study that I went through was my hairdresser thinks I'm on the rug. Thought I was on the rug. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm good with that. <laughs> was there a thought that you were on it at any point? Um, and did I, it, in, it, yes. Yes, there, there, there was a time, but again, I'm a really positive person, and I have deep, deep faith, and and it, God's taking me where He needs me to be. Yeah, sounds good. Man. Very good. So, um, uh, Terry is our next um, a patient, if you will. So, um, and again, I'm going to have him tell the story. He actually was on the same trial, and I wanted to, uh, Terry to come by and talk about his experience. It was a little bit different, but please, please start. Good morning. 2013, I, uh, my family doctor, family practice doctor, observed a suspicious mole on my uh, side of my left temple and referred me on to uh, a physician in that, in fact, I saw Michigan State and Michigan. If there was another uh, mouse in that fight, it would probably be Ohio. State. Uh, anyway, I'm an Ohio State mouse. Uh, and uh, again, we were in, I think, uh, November of 2013. Uh, uh, the oncologist uh, did a biopsy, determined I had a melanoma, uh, recommended surgery, uh, was successful. Uh, it had not migrated into my lymph system. Uh, the care plan at that point was to work with a dermatologist on a regular basis. It, uh, essentially, they said I should go monthly uh, so they could observe my body to make sure that there was no, nothing else suspicious going on. Four months later, um, as I'm planning a, a trip of a lifetime for me to go to the Masters uh, on my 65th birthday and then play the Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail, uh, the day of the final meeting with my group that was going on the trip, uh, I also had a, an appointment with my dermatologist. He did a biopsy on another suspicious spot on uh, uh, my neck. And uh, my job uh, after meeting with the, the group was to get the hotel reservations for, for the Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail and to uh, also get the hotel for uh, Augusta which I proceeded to do, and four days later, I got notice uh, from my dermatologist that I had another melanoma. Um, he suggested that, uh, given the size of it, that I should uh, go to the University of Michigan. I questioned why, as I thought I could just have it done locally again, and he said, uh, trust me, you want to go to U of M, uh, the folks there, uh, you know, they have a a division within the cancer center that's specific to head and neck cancers. Uh, Dr. Carol Bradford was uh, 
the position that I was referring to. She is the chair of that department. Uh, Dr. Bradford um, uh, did, an, uh, did another biopsy, determined that th this particular melanoma had uh, penetrated my lymph system. Uh, I had surgery in, uh, not to remember the dates, in, in, in May of last year. Uh, and uh, post-operative post uh, care plan was a refer referral to Dr. Lau. Uh, and yeah, he presented to me uh, four options, um, one of which was to uh, be under continuous surveillance, um, periodic CTs, blood work, etc. cetera. Um, second option, available was to take uh, chemo interferon uh, weekly chemo for a year uh, third option was radiation therapy um, we didn't spend much time looking at that and then the fourth option was the clinical trial uh, with the denofer I wrote down took copious notes here <coughs> help me uh, Dr. Lau the dabrofenib and trimetanib and, uh, you know, he presented, uh, I think, uh, he and Susan presented uh, thorough information to me about uh, the clinical trial. I went back to uh, Toledo and talked to my family. I talked to uh, physicians, and I thought that it was uh, a win-win to go in that direction. Um, and the way I, I kind of analyzed it, I said, I know it was a double-blind if I was given the placebo um, as part of the trial, which was going to be a year-long trial, I would get continuous surveillance uh, uh, by Dr. Lau and uh, his caregivers. Um, I would get periodic CT, uh, blood work, etc. cetera, uh, all of which is, I think, critical to manage melanoma. Um, I thought that if I was given the medication, as opposed to the placebo, I certainly could uh, benefit by having the medication. The, the two medications had already been approved individually to address either the, the growth of melanoma or the potential to uh, remove uh, or to minimize the growth of melanoma. So I thought that was a win if I was on the medication. The downside of being on it are the side effects. Um, and so I, uh, I chose to take, uh, get into the trial. I think we started in September. Um, and, you know, going in, I said, oh, it's up with a wink and a nod, I guess you'll know right away whether you're on the med or you're not on the med or you're on the placebo. And, uh, yeah, I found out quickly. And I'll, uh, and then fast forward a year, uh, the trial is, for me, is over. <coughs> and uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, and I will allow you to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, specific, there are two things with, with your story, too, I think. One is that you did get a significant amount of side effects, if you recall, with fevers and chills and just feeling kind of poorly. Um, and, you know, because of that, we had to have you come in multiple times. You have to be evaluated for infection, uh, be seen, travel. It's pretty demanding, I would say. Um, and then the issue of whether you believe you're on the treatment or on placebo, some of that stuff becomes unbearable. And it can be very, very difficult. And so you end up with a decision, you know, is this worth kind of continuing on when you think you are getting something, or should you come off? And if, yeah, Can you I talk about that was a... compelling on, on one of your slides, the do no harm uh, principle that you would hear to as, as managing a, a program like this here. And clearly, uh, my reaction was pretty severe. Um, and the wink and the nod was, I guess I'm on the medication and I'm having an adverse reaction as opposed to being on a placebo. However, I, I also understand that you can have adverse reaction to placebo just having the mind taking over uh, your clear thoughts, but um, so after a couple of uh, being, on the being on the medication, I'm assuming, 
um, and having pretty severe reaction, high temperature, fever, um, uh, chills, and uh, miscellaneous other uh, reaction. Um, I was put on a drug holiday for a bit and then put back on a medication. Um, same reaction again, um, each time very carefully scrutinized by Dr. Lau, and uh, we agreed um, probably three weeks into the trial that it would probably be best that I um, stop taking the medication, whether it be the placebo or the gymnocrative. Uh, yes. Yeah, so imagine that can be a tough decision if you think you're getting that therapy and you have to come off, but it was really pretty severe. And again, we don't want to hurt people. We talk about the slides that, hey, can you just get a treatment? I'll just do this. But you might have severe side effects. Sometimes there's symptoms, but sometimes it can be even like threat. So, um, and then after that, it's still very, you know, dedication. We still, even though you're done with therapy, there's still a lot of monitoring. And, you know, thankfully, they've been willing to participate and continue to do so as we kind of continue to monitor people closely as we keep, you know, kind of th those results won't be available for a number of years, actually. But we appreciate uh, both of you uh, your commitment into the participation, so thank you. So I have, um, I have two other folks that talk about their experience, and so this is a little bit different. So I wanted to put up here just as a kind of schema. So this is a, um, one of the um, a, a recent results, actually, that was reported out. You may have heard in the news earlier this year, this new treatment of ipilimumab and nivolumab. So actually it was approved in combination now just, uh, just a couple of days ago. But this is one trial that actually led to a lot of those kind of positive results. But this is a trial looking at this combination here, and this is again randomly assigned to get these different treatments. So 300 people were on each of these, have dedicated their time and efforts and you know, risks of the treatments to go, on to, these, uh, to go on to this trial. So this is a combination of the two. This is nivolumab by itself, and then ipilimumab itself. And we follow people over time. This also, interesting enough, had a placebo uh, component to it, which in addition uh, to that treatment. Very, very complicated, very, very difficult study to do. But again, at the dedication of actually the staff and the patients, um, they actually, <coughs> when the results came out earlier this year, they looked positive. They actually looked positive really for all three, but um, potentially the combination would be better for some people. But again, we, compare, we, we have to tease that out with the side effects and other things. And all of these things are things that we gained from this particular trial. And this was presented again at our national meeting in June, actually, as another breakthrough uh, in melanoma. So again, for, for um, you know, these results were, were only available because of the dedication of patients, um, people participating on that. And two of those patients are, are here today to share their experience with that trial. Um, and so uh, Christine is, again, uh, one of the patients, who were first, one of the first patients on the trial, and so if you, I'd like to tell your story to be great. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> well, I started out with um, being on a trip for my business, for the business I work for, and I was in Cleveland, and I was in the hotel, and I noticed that I had this mole on my back, but it was kind of small, and nothing was really happening with it, and for some reason, I was, you know, watching television, laying in bed, enjoying myself, and I, it felt like it burned. It didn't feel right to me. And um, so I got up and started looking at it. And of course, it was just far enough that I really couldn't get to it either. And um, it was really bugging me. So then I started looking on an iPad, which is the worst thing to do sometimes, because I started scaring myself with everything I was seeing about I thought, this is, could be melanoma. And um, I thought, I got to get this off. I, it's gotta get off. I have to have it off my body right now. And I was just adamant about it. So I called the dermatologist in Jackson, because that's where we're from, and I said, you've got to get me in. I've got a mole on my back. It's got to come off my back. And they said, all right, we'll get you in. And they made the appointment for like six weeks out. Well, I thought, mm -mm, that's not going to work for me. Um, I said, put me on the cancellation list. I need, this, I need this off like today. I mean, if you can get me in this week, that would be great. So they called me back, and they were able to get me in, and um, they took a look at it. They said, I don't think it's too much to worry about. Um, we'll, we'll take it off and do a biopsy on it. We'll let you know. I said, all right, that's great. So about a week later, um, I get a call, and it was probably the worst call I could have ever had in my life, because this um, nurse 
she just came right out and said, I want you to get your life in order. She said, you uh, have melanoma, it is malignant, and you need to get a hold of your family and let them know. I, it just kind of set me back. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, I knew something was wrong, but I wasn't ready for that. So I had to go went back in for a, an incision, an excision, and they were going to take like a, um, a football shape. And when I heard, when I heard football, all I could think of was like football, right? I thought, really? I mean, it just seemed like an overkill, but I thought, well, whatever. And so I get in there, and they actually, they actually took just a circle. So they took a smaller margin, and at that time I thought, hmm, I, I thought it was supposed to be like a football shape, but they took it. And uh, about a week and a half later, two weeks, they called me and they said, you're good, you're good. But as part of this procedure, you need to go to the U of M and have a bigger excision because these little cells have a tendency to, to move and uh, we want you to do that. So I said, all right. So um, they got me hooked up with Dr. Sable and he did the excision and um, pretty much um, you know, got through all of that and then we met with him and he had the bad job of having to tell me that I was in stage four of melanoma. I felt sorry for him more than I did myself, and my husband, just to look on his face, it was, it was terrible. But uh, Dr. Sable, you know, he told us what to expect. He said, you know, I, I right away was full of questions and wanted to understand, you know, what was my next step, and he wanted me to get with an oncologist, and so I got, I got hooked up with Dr. Lau. And when I went to see Dr. Lau, actually, I'm going to say after I met with Dr. Sable, I was probably, like Gail said, you're just kind of like a basket case. You have to go through every emotion that your body is physically capable of to get to a point where you're going to deal with it. So my husband didn't know what to do with me for about five days because all I did was just cry and, and feel sorry for myself and, and not, you know, kind of under, not understand why this was happening to me, why me. So after five days, I think I just finally said, you know, this is not the way to deal with this. I've got to deal with it differently. I have a heavy faith. I just said, here, you can have it. And pretty much I thought, you know, I've got to be positive. I have the, I have the ability to, to be part of my healing. And I remember meeting uh, Dr. Lau, and the first time I met him was December 24th. It was Christmas Eve. Because I actually was diagnosed with this in 2013. And in 2014, um, 2013, the end of 2013, I was having my excisions and stuff like that. And in December of 2013, I met Dr. Lau and Susan and his team, and pretty much um, we kind of went through and looked at what were the therapies that were available to me. My husband and I, we you know talked about it, looked at each other, weren't sure what we wanted to do, and they, I mean some of them just the results of them just didn't seem that great to me. And Dr. Lau said, you know, there's going to be a, cl a clinical trial starting up in January. Are you interested? And he kind of explained some of it. And I know my husband kind of looked at him and said, well, what would you do? And he said, I have her in the clinical trial. And that's all we needed to hear. So one thing that I think just set me um, aside and said, okay, things are going to get better. And Dr. Lau pretty much said, you know, I'm here to, he I'm here to try to heal you. I'm not trying to make you comfortable. I'm, I want to heal you. And that's all I needed to hear, with my faith and with him, and, and just looking at, um, you know, what we were going to deal with. I thought, I have to be, I have to have a good attitude. I have to have, I have to be positive. And so I turned it all around, and my husband come home with me for work, was like, you're a whole different person. And I was like, yeah, I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tackle this, and we're going to do this. And I went on the clinical trial, and that clinical trial, I had to go in there every other week, and it was pretty much ended up being our date day. I mean, we'd get up in the morning early, we were the first ones here usually. Um, you know, we had a blood draw, we saw Dr. Lau, and we went for infusion. And I think the hardest thing in the whole trial, because we were on a double blind, and I didn't believe that, I thought Dr. Lau knew for sure what he I was on. <laughs> and, I, and I just, I'm like the little girl at Christmas that can't stand anything wrapped, and so it was, it was the worst thing for me um, ever. Take a drink. And I would come in every, and he can attest to this, 
I'd come in every time I'd have to see him and that's the first thing I'd, are you sure you don't know? I mean, I, yeah. are you sure? Because, you know, so I did that a lot. But um, I finally, I find, well, I'm still not over it, but that's okay. Um, I still don't know either, so that's okay too. But, um, so January, I, I was, uh, I was uh, actually accepted into the trial. Uh, started the trial January 31st, it was somewhere around there. And then about, I'm going to say July of that same year, which is last year, my scan started to show on the cancer and be free. And April of this year, I actually went off the trial. And um, but I'm going to tell you, um, if I didn't have really any side effects except some itching. Um, and I didn't really have a rash, but I I itched and you know all over. I was like itchy. But other than that, I really didn't have a lot of side effects from it. And I think a lot of it was attributed to just, I just decided it wasn't going to have me. And I, I said, I'm not going to have any side effects. I'm going to go in there, I'm going to do this, and we're going to get through this. And I think when you are in a clinical trial, you know you're in a trial, they give you this list of symptoms, you know, side effects, and you're looking at them. And I mean, they're just common things that you, you know, you might be achy, or you might be this, or well, I, I get those anyway. So it's hard sometimes <laughs> to determine, you know, I could come in and just complain about everything, or I had to think about it and say, I'm like that anyway. Is this my normal, or am I trying to apply everything to the clinical trial? So I was really careful about that, and I really only have to say that right now, I mean, the itching, I probably was a little tired at times, but other than that, um, you know, it, it was easy, and um, the, the team was absolutely wonderful. Everybody is so, you know, they're asking you the right questions. They're trying to get you to, you know, Dr. Lowe's <coughs> asked me certain things when I come in that, you know, we kind of could tease about it. It's like, no, I still don't have that symptom. And uh, but anyway, it was a, it's a, it was a good experience. I'm still, you know, being monitored heavily. Every three months I'm having a CT. I still have a brain MRI every six months. And that will go on because this is really important. And I think that's one of the things that made me so positive about this. I'm not just helping myself, I'm helping a lot of people. outside my whole life. Um, I started seeing a dermatologist regularly when I lived in Bay City. And uh, because of work, I moved up to the Traverse City area. I didn't have a dermatologist for a while. Um, I had a few things burned or cut off me over the years. And uh, I had a family physician, and I, needed to, <clears throat> I knew I needed to get a dermatologist. So I asked my family physician if he knew any good dermatologists. And he said, yes, my wife's a dermatologist. So. Uh, I went and saw her uh, for my first visit in 2008. It had been a probably a couple of years since I'd had a dermatology visit. And that uh, was near the end of 2008 in December. And she noticed something on my back. And she did a, uh, a biopsy of it and called me back in a few days and says, hey, you know, I've got some bad news. Um, you have a melanoma and, you know, it's four millimeters deep. And, you know, like I said, I've been used to having things cut off me before, and I thought, well, it's no big deal, what if we're going to cut this off and, you know, are you going to burn it off, or, or what, you know, what are we going to do? And she goes, no, it's a little more serious than that. She says, we want, you're going to need surgery and uh, maybe some uh, immunotherapy after that, or chemotherapy. I'm like, what? I couldn't believe, you know, I was, didn't realize what the impact or significance of having a melanoma like that was. So she and her husband both recommended that I come down to U of M for my surgery, which I did. And Dr. Reese, I don't know if he's, Riley Reese, I don't know if he's still in, in surgery here or not, but um, he did the surgery, great guy. Um, they did the markers around there, and it didn't, when I got the report about uh, the markers and stuff, it showed, uh, and they did a little biopsy in, uh, in my lip node in my uh, armpit, and nothing there. So uh, everything was good. I thought I had dodged a bullet, and I continued. I started seeing an oncologist 
in Traverse City, and I would go every six months and have a set of you know chest and chest X-rays, and then every other six months I would have a CT of my you know chest and, and pelvis, and you know it was on to oh, 2013, so it was like four years later, um, close to that something just kind of popped up on one of my chest X-rays, only very small in my lung. And uh, didn't know exactly what it was, and it was actually too small a biopsy, so we continued to watch it. He did a CT on it and didn't show anything more. Um, continued to watch it, and it continued to develop, I know, every three months. After about six months, I think, so, I think it was, um, it was big enough to biopsy. They did a long biopsy, and it came back, you know, melanoma. Uh, and the BRAF mutation, wild type, I believe it was. And uh, so we had to start talking about treatments um, with him. And he talked about, he gave me some information about IL-2 and, you know, mentioned that they couldn't do it there. There was only a couple of places that it could be done because it was uh, such a tough, tough um, therapy. And he mentioned IPI, doing Ipilumab. Um, he said that, uh, you know, he had never administered it himself, but he had a couple of his colleagues in practice with him that had. And it was, it was at that point that my wife got involved and in being the Google queen that she is, started doing some research. And uh, she has a friend of hers that is uh, a friend of someone that's uh, an oncologist in Poptoski, which is where I live now, Harbor Springs, you know, the Poptoski Hospital. So he recommended that we uh, see physicians at Carmanos and down here. You know, we went to Carmanos first um, for no other, no, no other reason than just the first one we could get in. And uh, we saw Dr. Flaherty there and he talked to us about IL-2 and everything else and explained, you know, in great detail um, the, you know, the disease and how it can progress and things like that. Um, so, but he said, you know, I can treat you with IL-2, he says, but you really need to get over to U of M and make an appointment with to see Dr. Lau um, because they have a clinical trial that's starting up that I think would be of great benefit to you. He gave me Susan's phone number and we called over there and within a day, I think, we got a call back, made the appointment and we went down and had our initial consultation and they explained the uh, you know, to trial, you know, what was going to happen, what wasn't going to happen, in really great detail. It made it so it was really easy to make an informed decision about it. I mean, and uh, my thinking was, well, if I stay here, I'm just going to get, I'm going to get Ippy anyhow. And when you looked at the trial, you were going to get that in some manner for some period of time anyhow, too, for at least 12 weeks. So I, I really felt I didn't have anything to lose. And I learned how aggressive what I had is. And I also felt that if I'm gonna go down, I'm going down fighting, and I'm gonna to try to help somebody else along the way too. Other, I may not benefit from it, but other people may. So decided to get in the trial. Um, long drive down here, and especially in the winter. <laughs> um, I, I think I told Dr. Lau before, I think I had a um, higher higher chance of uh, getting whacked on the road than having this, uh, you know, this get me. So, continued on, um, you know, in the, in the thought process, you know, am I errant? I, I knew I was getting something in some manner, shape, or form. Um, and at about tw at 12 weeks out, I had my first set of scans, and Dr. Lau came in and he says, you know, I, don't have, I don't have good news, he said, I have great news. And it was almost essentially gone. Very small left in both, because it had moved into both lungs. And two small ones, the left one and the, the bigger one, which was like, I think 30 millimeters in the right lung. That was the one that was on the go. And uh, the ones in the left lung were not detectable, and the one in the right lung was very small. Very small, probably. It, it remains there, but it's, thinking is it's perhaps just a little bit of scar tissue. So um, I was on the trial for, I was traveling for, oh, about a year and a half. And after the drug, uh, Nivalumab got 
approved. Um, the thought process was that I would come off and stay in the trial with the monitoring and everything else, but uh, not get the, the infusions anymore every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything so far, everything's been great. A uh, couple minor side effects that I didn't even feel until about six months out, I lost my sense of taste, still haven't recovered it. And uh, well, I have lost some pigment, and that probably won't come back either. Uh, but that's okay. Um, being here is a lot better than, than, the, than the alternatives. So I'm very happy with things. The staff, everybody here is a top rate, top notch. Um, I hope that at some point in time, people, that this would be the standard of care for everybody, and that they won't have to travel, you know, days, you know, this far to get treatment that everybody in the, in the hospitals, their treatment centers will have this available to them as uh, just a regular, regular care that's offered to anybody. Fantastic. I think um, we're a little pressed for time, so I think you guys agreed to uh, be open to questions. I think we're going to, just again, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to be available, actually. Um, there are a lot of questions. I think they submitted a lot of things to kind of go through. So, you know, unfortunately, we can't answer all of them. But um, we're going to be available after that. If you have, again, if you guys have specific questions. So, again, please thank uh, our A few last thoughts. Again, so we still, just, <laughs> it's okay, just a few last thoughts. But, so many more questions. Again, even though, even though we, you know, we have these trials, we're really excited about them, there's still a ton of stuff to do. Some of the stuff doesn't work for some people. And so how, how, do, we, how do we make them better? Um, you know, with these therapies, you know, there's a, now with other options, and what do we do first? I mean, all these things need to be answered. You know, combining these together, completely different treatment, again, for people who don't have it. And again, these rare cancers, rare types, and are they, do they behave the same? We need to do dedicated trials for these, and we are working on this right now. You well, know, again, oculum on them, and on them. So final thoughts, really, you know, the clinical trials are the way to at least do our best to try to prove that treatment is safe and effective. Um, but we really need people, and again, you know, patients dedicate really their lives um, the time, risk, side effects, biopsies, um, many, many people. In fact, we sat in on, on, on someone who had a, a biopsy that was ever just for the research purposes to be able to get in on it just, just a couple of days ago. So again, and traveling um, and dealing with a lot of these side effects are, are, are something that people really, um, you know, really commend them. We would never be able to get this, uh, get the answers if you we weren't having people who do that. Um, and of course, we need support. And these things all cost a tremendous amount of money. Um, and resources. There's uh, the federal government, you know, these are kind of flat, which is really kind of a decrease in the funding. Uh, but there's also other foundations like AML and all, which is, uh, provide support to be able to pay for all these things. Lab, and animals, people. So all of these things are going to afford them. So again, thank you to uh, people who participate and thank you guys for being a part of it. So thank you.